everyone and welcome. I'm Leah Somerville, a faculty member in the Department of Psychology and FAS, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lawrence Steinberg today as our speaker. I promise to be extremely brief in my introduction, so I'm not going to uh, go on and on about his 17 books, more than 350 papers, dozens of awards and prizes, and recent induction into the AAAS. Um, but what I can tell you briefly is that Dr. Steinberg is the Distinguished University Professor and Laura H. Carnell Professor of Psychology at Temple University. He's a leading authority on adolescent psychological development, and he's conducted decades of really impactful research in this area. Dr. Steinberg has also made a career of synthesizing emerging trends in research to shape policies concerning the treatment of youth in society, especially within the juvenile justice system. As one of many examples of the far-reaching impact of his work, Dr. Steinberg served as the lead scientist in the preparation of an amicus brief cited by the Supreme Court when they abolished the death penalty for juveniles uh, in the case of Roper v. Simmons. More recently, there's been a trend in the field of adolescent science to chart out trajectories of the developing brain and the impact of continued brain development on adolescent psychological functioning. Dr. Steinberg has been a pioneer in grappling with some very tough questions concerning the implications of this knowledge on policy issues that concern youth. And we're extremely fortunate to hear his views on this issue today. In his talk entitled, Should the Science of Adolescent Brain Development Inform Legal Policy? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lawrence Steinberg. Thank you, Leah. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you all for coming. Um, a few years ago, I found out that I had been nominated for an award given by the National Youth Rights Association. Um, the award was for Ageist of the Year. I was nominated for, in their words, distorting research in psychology to marginalize young adults. Um, I didn't win. I was beaten out for the award by Justice Clarence Thomas, um, who was recognized for his dissenting opinion in Brown versus the Entertainment Merchants Association, which is a 2011 uh, Supreme Court case about whether the state of California can ban the sale of violent video games to minors. And the court ruled that the ban violated minors' First Amendment rights. Thomas disagreed. He argued that the Constitution did not extend the First Amendment rights to young people, and you could see how that could kind of annoy the National Youth Rights Association. <laughs> so I'm still bitter over losing to Justice Thomas, but I understand why I was nominated. The broad conclusion of the research that my colleagues and I have been doing for the past 20 years is that adolescents are different from adults in fundamental ways that warrant their differential treatment under the law. And as Leah mentioned, our research was cited by the Supreme Court in its 2005 decision in Roper to abolish the juvenile death penalty, as well as in its 2010 decision in Graham to ban life without parole as a sentence for juveniles convicted of non-homicides, um, and in the 2012 decision in Miller to prohibit states from mandating life without parole for juveniles, regardless of the crime. And in each of these cases, the court concluded that the inherent developmental immaturity of young people diminished their criminal culpability to a degree that protects them against punishments that we reserve for fully responsible adults who commit the most serious crimes. And in Graham and Miller, the court explicitly cited research on adolescent brain development. Now, although these decisions are clearly in the best interests of young people, the same research that was cited in these cases also has been used by those who have argued that youthful immaturity justifies placing limits on adolescents' rights, such as the right to seek an abortion without parental permission. And in fact, just one year after Roper in Io versus Planned Parenthood, advocates of a law requiring parental notification before abortions um, the, before abortions can be performed on unemancipated minors, used the majority's logic in Roper to make the case that adolescents lacked sufficient maturity to make abortion decisions on their own. And in his dissenting opinion in the death penalty case, Justice Scalia took the American Psychological Association to task. 
for having opposed the juvenile death penalty on the grounds that juveniles are less mature than adults because that same organization had previously argued in favor of minors' rights to obtain an abortion without parental involvement on the grounds that adolescents were just as mature as adults. So later in my talk, I'm going to explain how I think these seemingly contradictory uh, positions can be reconciled. So my purpose in this lecture is to examine the relation between the science of adolescent brain development and legal and public policy involving adolescents. So as you probably know, the science of adolescent brain development is everywhere these days, not only in court decisions, but in New Yorker cartoons, on the covers of popular magazines, and in such unusual venues as the trial of the Boston Marathon bomber. The interest in whether adolescents are as mature as adults, whether in reference to the juvenile death penalty or other more mundane matters, such as whether the driving age ought to be raised, um, has been greatly stimulated during the past decade by the rapid expansion of knowledge about adolescent brain development. An explicit reference to the neuroscience of adolescence is slowly creeping into legal and policy discussions as well as popular culture. The evolution of the Supreme Court's consideration of brain science in the cases involving juvenile culpability is worth commenting on. The court's decisions have been increasingly influenced by findings from studies of brain development to support the position that adolescents are less mature than adults in ways that mitigate their criminal culpability, and that adolescents' diminished blameworthiness makes it inappropriate to sentence them in ways that are reserved for individuals who are deemed fully responsible for their criminal acts. Now, the more recent cases that I mentioned were, of course, not the first ones in which the court acknowledged that adolescents and adults are different in legally relevant ways. But they were the first to look to neuroscience for confirmation of what any parent knows, as Justice Kennedy put it in his majority opinion in Roper, the case that abolished the juvenile death penalty. Before Roper, neuroscience had not played a role in decisions about developmental differences between adolescents and adults, understandably, given how little published research there was on adolescent brain development prior to 2000. In Roper, adolescent brain development was mentioned during oral arguments, but it was never explicitly referenced in the court's opinions, which instead emphasized behavioral differences between adolescents and adults. In Graham, adolescent brain development was mentioned in Kennedy's majority opinion, but mainly in passing, in a single remark about the maturation in late adolescence of brain regions important for what he called behavior control. By the time the court decided Miller, neuroscience warranted an entire paragraph in the majority opinion. So writing for the majority, Justice Kagan noted that the behavioral science had become even stronger since Roper and Graham. She pointed out that the court's conclusions in those earlier cases continued to be strengthened by brain science and went into greater detail about the brain science, specifically mentioning adolescent immaturity in higher order executive functions, such as impulse control, planning ahead, and risk avoidance. This aspect of the majority opinion relied heavily on amicus briefs filed by scientific organizations, such as the American Psychological Association, which summarized the literature on adolescent brain development and connected it to the legal issues facing the court. And I was a contributor to this brief, as well as to the ones submitted in Roper and Graham. So the central legal issue in these three cases was whether the application of a particularly harsh sentence to a juvenile, such as the death penalty, or life without the possibility of parole, violates the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment, even if the same sentence is not a constitutional violation when applied to an adult. Now, some of you with no legal training may wonder how it can be that an identical punishment is cruel when applied to a juvenile, but not when applied to an adult. 
And the answer is found in what is referred to as a proportionality analysis, in which a punishment is considered cruel if it is judged to be excessive, given the nature and circumstances of the crime. So according to a core principle of the American justice system, fair punishment is based not only on the harm caused by the crime, but also on the blameworthiness of the perpetrator. So to take an extreme example, imagine that someone drops a stone from an overpass and that the stone shatters the windshield of a car, causing the driver to lose control, crash, and suffer a severe injury. Now consider the individual's age in deciding how he or she should be punished. I think few of us would conclude that an eight-year-old and a 26-year-old should be held equally accountable for the act. And few would think that it would be fair to punish an eight-year-old child to the same degree that we might punish a young adult, despite the fact that the crime and the resultant harm are the same in each case. So in a proportionality analysis, one would likely conclude that a severe punishment for a young adult who committed such an act of reckless endangerment might be entirely appropriate, but that the same sanction would be disproportionate and excessive when applied to a young child. So at issue in Roper and Graham and Miller, all of which involved juveniles who ranged in age from 14 to 17, was whether adolescents' developmental immaturity mitigates their blameworthiness to the extent that the punishment in question is disproportionate and such uh, a violation of the Eighth Amendment. So just to be clear, the question in these cases was not whether a juvenile's criminal act should be completely excused because of immaturity. Normally developing individuals are assumed to be capable of forming criminal intent by age seven. So rather, the issue was whether the sentence the juvenile received was excessive relative to the degree of responsibility he had for his behavior. Now, the court was split in each of these cases, and it's easy to see why. The distinction between an eight-year-old and a fully mature adult with respect to judgment, capacity to imagine the consequences of one's actions, and the ability to control oneself is obvious. The difference between adolescents and adults is not so clear cut. So prior to Roper, the court relied on common sense and on other laws regulating adolescents' behavior to draw legal boundaries between adolescents and adults for the purpose of determining criminal blameworthiness. And it had set the dividing line between ages 15 and 16, at least with respect uh, to eligibility for the death penalty. And two rulings laid much of the legal groundwork for Roper and the cases that followed. The first was Thompson versus Oklahoma, a 1988 case that prohibited capital punishment in cases involving individuals younger than 16. The second was Atkins versus Virginia, a 2002 case in which the court found the imposition of capital punishment on individuals with mental retardation to be unconstitutional on the grounds that even if a person knows the difference between right and wrong, mental retardation compromises his decision making in ways that make him less than fully responsible for his conduct. So although the ultimate conclusion that was reached in Roper was not logically different from the conclusions reached in Thompson or Atkins, Roper was important because here, unlike in the prior cases, the court grounded its reasoning in developmental science and not just in common sense. In Graham and Miller, which built on Roper, the court similarly looked to developmental science for guidance. Now these three cases raised another important issue concerning adolescent development, although neuroscience did not play a significant role in the court's analysis of it. This issue was whether the punishments in question should be prohibited categorically for all adolescents or considered on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on individualized assessments of the defendant's maturity. And in my view, this was really the central and difficult question in these cases. Some dissenting justices argued that while most adolescents were likely to be less mature than most adults, 
and therefore both less culpable and more amenable to rehabilitation, surely not all adolescents were. Shouldn't judges and juries have the option of identifying individuals for whom capital punishment or life without parole is an appropriate sanction? In Roper and Graham, the court's answer was no. In Miller, it barred states from making life without parole a mandatory sentence, but left open the possibility of its imposition, while noting that its use would likely be uncommon. Now, in my view, the court's shift away in Miller from a firm stance on maintaining a bright line boundary between adolescents and adults that's based on chronological age, uh, the shift makes no sense at all in light of the prior rulings. And one can only surmise that this was a key compromise that enabled the formation of a five-person majority. The problem with leaving life without parole for juveniles convicted of homicide on the table, even if it is used uncommonly, is twofold. First, it's not clear what criteria should be used to separate those who warrant the sentence from those who don't. And as we noted in the APA amicus brief, we social scientists are terrible at predicting which juvenile offenders will go on to become adult criminals. We know that only a small proportion will, but we are unable to pick them out of a lineup, even with the benefit of far more and better information than any court will ever have. Second, it's likely that factors that have nothing to do with the risk of future violence will unconsciously influence sentencing decisions. Because the race of the juvenile is likely to be one of these, we should be concerned that life without parole will be disproportionately imposed on black and Latino youth. And so banning life without parole for juveniles outright would have provided some protection against the impact of this bias, which is often unconscious. Courts and legislatures are now grappling with several implications of Miller. First, if not life without parole, then what? It's still possible in all 50 states to impose life sentences with the possibility of parole, but history teaches us that individuals convicted of murder are almost never granted parole. So a life sentence with parole may be more symbolic than substantive. It is also possible to impose very long sentences without parole on juveniles, which will function much like life sentences. For a 16-year-old, a 50-year sentence, which is still within his life expectancy, might as well be a life sentence. Now, a second concern involves the retroactivity of Miller. Though more than 2,000 inmates in America are currently serving life sentences without the possibility of parole for crimes they committed when they were younger than 18. And whether individuals who had been sentenced to life without parole when they were juveniles are now entitled to resentencing was the question posed in Montgomery versus Louisiana, which was argued in front of the Supreme Court one month ago today. And to date, you should know that state courts have been divided on this issue. If the court rules that Miller is retroactive, a new set of difficult issues will arise. What's an appropriate revised sentence? And what are the criteria that should be used to determine it? Should the focus be on the circumstances of the original offense, the behavior of the inmate during his incarceration, the likelihood of rehabilitation, or some combination of these? And within each of these categories, what are the relevant considerations? Well, how did behavioral and brain science figure into the court's analysis of whether the developmental immaturity of adolescents is sufficient to diminish their criminal responsibility? Writing for the court's majority in Roper, Justice Kennedy explicated three characteristics of adolescents that distinguish them from adults in ways that mitigate their culpability. First, Kennedy noted that adolescents are characterized by immaturity and an underdeveloped sense of responsibility, which leads them to make impetuous and ill-considered decisions. Second, he noted that adolescents are more susceptible than adults to external influences, especially peer pressure, which makes it difficult for them to extricate themselves from what he described as criminogenic situations. And finally, Kennedy wrote that the personality traits of adolescents are less fixed than they are in adults, 
and that this makes it difficult to infer that even heinous criminal behavior during adolescence is evidence of what he described as an irretrievably depraved character. And he stressed the fact that adolescents are better candidates for rehabilitation. So read sequentially, the briefs that APA filed in these cases reflect the growing influence of brain science, which was discussed cautiously um, in our Roper brief, but with increasing confidence in Graham and then in Miller. And although most of this work has appeared in just the last 15 years, there's already strong consensus among developmental neuroscientists about the nature of brain development during adolescence. And the most important conclusion to emerge from this research is that significant changes in brain anatomy and activity take place far longer into development than had been previously thought. So reasonable people may disagree about what these findings tell us about how we should treat young people. And those, after all, are political and practical and legal issues, not scientific ones. But there's little room for disagreement about the fact that adolescence is a period of substantial brain maturation. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, adolescent brain science, let me very briefly describe the most important changes in the brain structure and then turn to changes in the way the brain functions during adolescence. So four specific structural changes in the brain in adolescence are noteworthy. First, there's a decrease in gray matter in prefrontal regions of the brain during adolescence, reflective of synaptic pruning, the process through which unused connections between neurons are eliminated. And the elimination of these unused synapses occurs mainly during pre-adolescence and early adolescence, which is the period during which improvements in basic cognitive abilities and logical reasoning are seen, in part due to these anatomical changes. Second, and also occurring in early adolescence, especially around the time of puberty, are important changes in activity involving the neurotransmitter dopamine. There are substantial changes in the density and distribution of dopamine receptors in pathways that connect the limbic system, where emotions are processed and reward and punishment experienced, and the prefrontal cortex, which is the brain's chief executive officer. Because dopamine plays a critical role in our experience of pleasure, these changes have important implications for sensation-seeking behavior, as I will explain later. A third change in the brain's structure that takes place during adolescence is an increase in white matter in the prefrontal cortex. This is the result of myelination, the process through which nerve fibers become sheathed in myelin, a white fatty substance that improves the efficiency of brain circuits. And unlike the synaptic pruning of the prefrontal areas, which is mainly finished by mid-adolescence, myelination continues well into the decade of the 30s. And more efficient neural connections within the prefrontal cortex are important for higher order cognitive functions that are regulated by multiple frontal areas working in concert. Functions like planning ahead and weighing risks and rewards and making complicated decisions. And finally, there's an increase in the strength of connections between the prefrontal cortex and other brain regions. Improved connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system is especially important for emotion regulation, which is facilitated by increased crosstalk between regions of the brain important in the processing of emotional information and those important in self-control. And these gains are also ongoing well into the early 20s. Now, adolescence is not just a time of tremendous change in the brain's structure. It's also a time of important changes in how the brain functions. First, over the course of early adolescence and into early adulthood, there's a strengthening of activity in brain systems involving self-regulation. And so during tasks that require a great deal of self-control, adults employ a wider network of brain regions than adolescents do, which may make self-control easier by distributing the work across multiple areas of the brain rather than overtaxing a smaller number of regions. 
brain systems important for self-control continued to become more effective into the early 20s. Second, their important changes during adolescence around the time of puberty and linked to the impact of sex hormones on the brain in the way the brain responds to rewards. When you look at a brain scan acquired during a task in which individuals are shown rewarding stimuli, like piles of coins or pictures of smiling faces, you see that adolescents' reward centers light up more than do children's or adults when they expect something pleasurable to happen or when they actually receive a reward. And heightened sensitivity to rewards motivates adolescents to engage in acts, even risky acts, when the potential for pleasure is high. So for the past 10 years or so, my colleagues and I have been studying the impact of peers on adolescent brain activity. And we've shown that adolescents' hypersensitivity to reward is particularly pronounced when adolescents are with their friends, which we think helps explain why adolescent risk-taking, including criminal behavior, so often occurs in groups. This discovery has potential implications for how we view anti-gang laws, which frequently punish adolescent crimes committed in groups more harshly than those committed alone. It also has important implications for felony murder laws, which often impose extremely harsh sentences on adolescents who are bystanders to their friends' crimes. Group situations, in other words, actually exacerbate the very deficiencies in judgment that are thought to mitigate adolescents' criminal responsibility. Thus, the logic of punishing group crimes during adolescence more severely than crimes committed alone is antithetical to the general principle that adolescents' developmental immaturity mitigates their culpability. A third change in brain function over the course of adolescence involves increases in the simultaneous involvement of multiple brain regions in response to arousing stimuli like pictures of angry or fearful faces. And the ability to regulate these feelings improves as regions that govern emotional processing and self-control become more interconnected. And this is one reason we think that susceptibility to peer pressure declines as adolescents mature into adulthood. They're better able to put the brakes on an impulse that's aroused by their friends. And it also helps to explain why we become less likely during early adulthood to overreact to perceived threats than we are during adolescence. Now, the structural and functional changes that I've just described don't take place along one uniform timetable. And the differences in their timing raise two important points that are exceptionally relevant to the issue of neuroscience and the law. First, there's no simple answer to the question of when an adolescent brain becomes an adult brain. Brain systems implicated in basic cognitive processes reach adult levels of maturity by mid-adolescence, when synaptic pruning of the prefrontal cortex is complete. On tests of memory, for instance, or logical reasoning, there is little, if any, improvement after age 16. But psychological processes important for things like impulse control do not mature until late adolescence or even early adulthood. In other words, adolescents mature intellectually before they mature socially or emotionally. And this explains why teenagers who appear very intelligent in many respects often do reckless things that bewilder their parents. So to the extent that we want to rely on developmental neuroscience to inform where we draw age boundaries between adolescence and adulthood for purposes of legal policy, it's important to match the policy question with the right science. So I mentioned earlier that psychologists were criticized by Justice Scalia for arguing that adolescents are mature enough to make decisions about abortion, but not mature enough to be eligible for the juvenile death penalty. And on the surface, it seems like a flip-flop. But in terms of brain development, it's a very plausible possibility. The circumstances under which individuals make medical decisions and commit crimes are very different. And they make very different sorts of demands on individuals' brains and their abilities. State laws governing abortion require a waiting period before the procedure can be performed, as well as consultation with an adult 
parent, a health care provider, or a judge. These policies discourage impetuous and short-sighted acts, and they create circumstances under which adolescents' decision-making is, in fact, just as mature as adults is. In contrast, violent crime is usually committed by adolescents when they're emotionally aroused and with their friends, two conditions that increase the likelihood of impulsivity and sensation-seeking, and that exacerbate adolescent immaturity. So from a neuroscientific standpoint, it makes perfect sense to have a lower age for autonomous medical decision-making than for eligibility for capital punishment. Now, the fact that different brain structures and systems reach adult levels of maturity at different ages raises another set of challenges in addition to those raised in Scalia's dissent. We are now confident that certain aspects of brain development continue into the early 20s, primarily those involving greater connectivity between cortical and subcortical areas. So what are the implications of this science for the treatment of young adults under the law? If the argument about the diminished responsibility of juveniles is bolstered by discoveries about the inherent neurobiological immaturity of adolescents, shouldn't this line of reasoning extend beyond age 18? After all, at least with respect to connectivity, the brain of a 20-year-old isn't as mature as the brain of a 25-year-old. There's been a lot of discussion of this issue lately, stimulated in part by a report that was recently released by two scholars at Harvard's Kennedy School, Vincent Schiraldi, who's here today, and Bruce Western. And in that report, they called for a number of reforms, including raising the jurisdictional boundary between juvenile and criminal court to at least age 21. So I share these authors' view that we need to rethink the way in which we view young adults who come into contact with the justice system. But I do not believe that the neuroscientific evidence is at present sufficiently compelling or conclusive enough to justify this policy change. One problem is that most extant studies of brain development during the period between ages 10 and 25 have not drawn distinctions among individuals who are older than 18, often combining these individuals into an adult comparison group that's contrasted with adolescents 17 and younger. Now, this is certainly a state of affairs that can be addressed, but so far it hasn't been and policy recommendations about the treatment of young adults that are grounded in neuroscience are premature. Indeed, last month, in connection with a case on which I was consulting that involved a 21-year-old defendant, I contacted B.J. Casey, Sarah Jane Blakemore, and Evelyn Crone, arguably the leading adolescent brain scientists in the United States, Great Britain, and the Netherlands, respectively. And I asked each of them whether any uh, of them was aware of literature reviews on brain development in young adulthood. And I was told that no such reviews exist, perhaps because no literature exists. So a study I'm currently involved in, conducted by the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on Law and Neuroscience, is focusing on this exact question. Are people between the ages of 18 and 21 more like adolescents, or are they more like adults? And the results of our first two sets of analyses, which are still under review, and so I'm asking you not to cite this, the results of these analyses suggest that the answer is going to be very complicated. In one study, we looked at age differences in self-control under three conditions, negative emotional arousal, positive emotional arousal, or no emotional arousal. And we compared three age groups. 13 to 17 year olds, 18 to 21 year olds, and 22 to 25 year olds. So under conditions of negative emotional arousal, the young adults were similar to the adolescents. Um, and they differed from older individuals in both their behavior and their brain activity. But under conditions of positive emotional arousal, the young adults differed from the adolescents and they were similar to the older group. Now, because some crimes are committed when individuals are frightened or threatened, but others take place when they're exhilarated or excited, it isn't immediately clear which of our comparisons should inform judgments about the relative neurobiological maturity of young adults. 
In a different study by our group, we looked at patterns of resting state connectivity in these same individuals. And we then used these data to develop computer models that permitted us to estimate each individual's brain age. That is, the chronological age one would predict that person was on the basis of the brain data. Some of the young adults evinced patterns that looked more like teenagers, while others looked more like the older group. More important and more interestingly, the more adolescent-like a young adult's brain age was, the more real-world risk-taking the person reported engaging in. In other words, there's considerable neurobiological heterogeneity within the young adult group. Now, of course, we know that there's a lot of heterogeneity within the juvenile and adult populations as well. But to the extent that the distinction between young adults and people in their late 20s is not as clear-cut as advocates might wish it were, these sorts of findings are going to raise questions about the utility of drawing a new categorical boundary between juveniles and adults. Now, I don't think that this poses an insurmountable problem for those of us who believe that we need to rethink how we treat people in their late teens and early 20s when they violate the law. But I think that in this instance, it's sociological and historical data, not neuroscience, that make the policy shift compelling. When the jurisdictional boundary between juvenile and adult court was originally established, the life circumstances of 18-year-olds were in fact more similar to those of adults than to those of teenagers. What young adults needed in order to be rehabilitated and reintegrated into the community was not all that different from what their slightly older counterparts needed, mainly some kind of vocational training. Today, however, the status and needs of young adults are more like those of adolescents. And what young adults who are leaving the justice system need is education. And the sorry truth is that at present, neither the juvenile nor the adult system is well positioned to do this for people in this age period. And as I elaborate a little bit later, many of the legal questions raised about the treatment of young people are actually more informed by social and behavioral science than by neuroscience. Now, there's a different kind of asynchrony in brain development during adolescence that's important for public policy. And this concerns the different developmental trajectories of sensation seeking and impulse control. Sensation seeking, the tendency to pursue novel, exciting, and rewarding experiences, follows an inverted U-shaped curve. It increases substantially around the time of puberty, remains high well into the late teens when it begins to decline. Impulse control is different. It's low during childhood and improves gradually over the course of adolescence and early adulthood. Now, virtually all studies of this have been conducted in the US, with a few exceptions of a couple of studies done in the Netherlands and in Great Britain. My colleagues and I have just finished a study of more than 5,000 adolescents and young adults in 11 countries around the world. And we see the very same patterns in sensation seeking and impulse control in this sample that we saw previously. And we see the same patterns in Asian and in Western countries, in rich and in poor countries, and in countries where adolescence is socially very long and in countries where it is relatively brief. The different timetables of sensation seeking and impulsivity creates a vulnerability to risky and reckless behavior that's greater in middle adolescence than before or after. Middle adolescence is a period during which brain systems implicated in our responses to rewards are at their height of arousability, but when systems important for self-regulation are still immature. It's no surprise that crime peaks around age 17 or 18. So do most types of risk behavior, including experimentation with drugs and alcohol, attempted suicide, accidental drownings, um, and uh, reckless driving. Scientific data in support of this general view of adolescence, that it's a time of heightened sensation seeking and still maturing self-control, form the basis for Kennedy's characterization of adolescence in the Roper decision as impetuous, vulnerable to peer pressure, and relatively unformed in their character. And research findings consistent with this became even more extensive by the time Graham and Miller were argued. And numerous self-report and behavioral studies find that adolescents 
are, compared to adults, more impulsive, more likely to engage in sensation seeking, and more likely to focus on the potential rewards than the potential risks of a choice. And other studies show that adolescents' vulnerability to peer pressure is greater than it is during adulthood as well. There's less research on personality development, um, but in general, what we know is that the transition from adolescence to adulthood is marked by increasing stability and the growth in maturity and self-control. And many studies have been published showing that more than 90% of juvenile offenders desist from crime by their mid-20s. And as I mentioned before, that the prediction of violence from adolescent criminal behavior is unreliable and prone to error. Now, if you look at the court's use of neuroscience in its thinking and in its decision making, you see something very interesting about its beliefs about neuroscience compared to its beliefs about behavioral science. I want to just quote something that I find fascinating from oral arguments in Roper. So during these arguments, Seth Waxman, who was the attorney arguing for the abolition of the juvenile death penalty, was asked by Justice Breyer what science told us about adolescents that we didn't already know. And Waxman replied that the science, quote, explains, corroborates, and validates what we sort of intuitively know. And then he added, and I'm not just talking about social science here, but the important neurobiological science. So the implication is clear. That neuroscience adds validity to an argument that is grounded only in common sense and less persuasive developmental psychology. In fact, by the time Miller was decided, in the eyes of the court, the brain was the fundamental driver of the development of maturity. So in her majority opinion, Justice Kagan noted, as the years go by and neurological development occurs, adolescence deficiencies will be reformed. So for better or for worse, neuroscience appears to have played a role in persuading the justices that the psychological differences between adolescents and adults, as described in Roper, were real. They weren't just something concocted by a bunch of soft-hearted and soft-headed psychologists. So if you look at the dissenting opinions in each case, what you see is that the justices who voted in the minority moved from a position of some skepticism about whether adolescents were inherently different from adults to one in which the matter was no longer even contested. So recall Scalia's dissent in Roper, in which he implied that the developmental immaturity argument advanced by social scientists was just a convenient fabrication concocted by advocates to suit their political aims. By the time Miller was decided, things had changed. In his dissenting opinion, Chief Justice Roberts noted that Roper and Graham undoubtedly stand for the proposition that teenagers are less mature, less responsible, and less fixed in their ways than adults. To which he then added, not that a Supreme Court case was needed to establish that. Of course, the Supreme Court case was needed to establish that, but. Uh, so we don't know whether the court's ultimate acceptance of this characterization of adolescence was influenced by neuroscience, but I can tell you as one of the authors of the APA amicus briefs that the only substantive change that we made in those briefs between Roper and Graham and Miller was the addition of more neuroscience to our citation list. Now, we know that neuroscience is more um, persuasive to lay people than behavioral science is. Um, but it isn't exactly clear how informative brain science really is with respect to legal policy. Because all behavior must have neurobiological underpinnings, it is hardly revelatory to say that adolescents behave the way they do because of something in their brain. I mean, where else would we look to explain how they behave if not that organ? So behind, beyond the strategic and cynical exploitation of people's ignorance, how does neuroscience add to the discussion about how to view adolescents under the law? After all, writers as far back as Aristotle have been describing adolescents as impulsive and reckless. And as, if, as Kennedy famously wrote in Roper, any parent knows that adolescents are different, why do we need brain science to make the point? So I think that neuroscience is helpful in two ways that are a little more dignified than the strategic one. 
First, neuroscience can provide additional validation for behavioral evidence when the neuroscience and the behavioral science are conceptually and theoretically aligned. Because scientific evidence of any sort is always more compelling when it has been shown to be validated, when neuroscientific findings about the adolescent brain are consistent with findings from behavioral research, the neuroscience gives us added confidence in the behavioral research. But my point is that it's incorrect to privilege the neuroscientific evidence over the behavioral evidence. Neuroscience should play a supporting role, not a leading one. A second way in which neuroscience can be helpful in our understanding of adolescent culpability concerns the attributions we make about individuals' criminal behavior. In order for something to diminish criminal responsibility, it has to be something that was not the person's fault, something outside his or her control. Somebody has an untreatable tumor on his frontal lobe that's thought to make him unable to control aggressive outbursts, he's less than fully responsible for his aggressive behavior as a result of something that isn't his fault. And this would be viewed as a mitigating factor if he were being sentenced for a violent crime. On the other hand, if someone with no neurobiological deficit goes into a bar and drinks himself into a state of rage and commits a violent crime, the fact that he was drunk doesn't diminish his responsibility for his act at all. What's important here is that it doesn't matter whether the mitigating factor is biological or psychological or environmental. That's not the issue. The issue is whether the diminished responsibility is the person's fault and whether the individual could have been able to compensate for whatever it is that was uncontrollable. In contrast to what many people think, the brain science isn't important because it provides biological evidence. It's important because it points to something out of the individual's control. Now, studies of adolescent brain anatomy clearly indicate that regions of the brain that regulate things like foresight and impulse control and resistance to coercion are still developing at age 17. And we can document changes in gray matter and white matter in relevant brain regions. And imaging studies that show that immaturity in these areas is directly linked to adolescents' poor performance on tasks that require these capabilities provide additional support. Now, I think that there's evidence that the adolescent brain is less mature than the adult brain in ways that impact some of the behaviors that mitigate criminal responsibility. And that adolescents irresponsible behavior isn't entirely their fault any more than an infant's inability to walk is her fault. The brain science shouldn't carry the day, but I think it helps tip the balance toward viewing adolescent impulsivity and short-sightedness and, and, and susceptibility to peer pressure as developmentally normative phenomena that teenagers cannot fully control. And this is why I think we should view them as less culpable than adults even when they've committed the same crime. But what about the counter argument that some adults are just as impulsive and short-sighted as teenagers? And that in many cases, these deficiencies may be just as biologically ingrained and out of individuals' control as those that characterize adolescence. Why is immature judgment that falls short of mental disability or retardation a relevant factor in judging adolescence, but not adults? Impulsivity and sensation seeking, for instance, are both highly heritable. We even know which genes control the expression of these traits. So if the main reason for adolescents' diminished responsibility is that their poor judgment is not completely under their control, why doesn't this diminish the culpability of an adult who's similarly compromised and similarly unable to do anything about it? I've struggled a lot with this question. In, in, in recent years. I don't question the fact that adolescents' immature judgment mitigates their criminal culpability. I question why immature judgment during adolescence does, but immature judgment during adulthood doesn't. I've come to the conclusion that the issue isn't teenagers' immature judgment, per se, but the, but the combination of poor judgment and the potential for change that characterizes adolescence. So I now think that evidence on brain plasticity and the adolescent's capacity to change may be more relevant for the differential treatment of adolescents than is evidence of neurobiological immaturity that impairs their judgment or their ability to withstand coercion. 
So if we return to Kennedy's um, three features that distinguish adolescents from adults, there's, I think this is helpful in this analysis. The first, as you remember, was immature judgment. The second was susceptibility to peer pressure. And the third was unformed character. And although that third one has not received much attention in discussions of adolescent punishment, I think that this is the absolute essential one for the argument that juveniles should not be sanctioned as harshly as adults. And without including that one, the, um, the argument that immature judgment mitigates their culpability backs us into a very troublesome corner where the congenital jerk who is incapable of considering the long-term consequences of his actions should escape full criminal liability. So it's not adolescence immature judgment, but it's transient nature that's the key. So I have been writing lately um, about adolescence as a time of heightened brain plasticity. And I think the evidence now is pointing to this idea that there are two significant periods of brain plasticity in human development. And one of them involves the first three to five years of life, but there's a second period of heightened plasticity that occurs during adolescence. And I think that that the evidence of adolescent brain plasticity is a very important part of our consideration of whether and in what ways adolescents should be treated differently when they come into contact with the justice system. Because what that means has two important implications for us. The first is that adolescent brain plasticity makes them better candidates for rehabilitation than older individuals who don't enjoy the same degree of malleability in the brain. In some senses, adolescence may be the last time in human development when the brain is ever this plastic. But a second point is that plasticity cuts both ways, and that the same malleability of the brain that makes it able to benefit from rehabilitative experiences makes it easily harmed by toxic ones. And that means that when we sanction adolescents by putting them into correctional environments that deprive them of adequate stimulation or that expose them to incredibly harsh conditions, that we need to remind ourselves that we're exposing people to these contexts at a time when their brain is particularly vulnerable to the environment in which they're living. So I think that the evidence, the emerging evidence on brain plasticity during adolescence makes a compelling case for thinking about responding to adolescent lawbreaking in ways that take advantage of this plasticity and that protect vulnerable individuals from the harmful and toxic experiences that pervade many correctional environments. So um, I know some of you need to leave at one, so let me just conclude um, with some um, recommendations for what we need to do in the future, and then those of you who are able to stay um, can engage in um, question and discussion about this. Um, the, the, let's say just a few concluding words about neuroscience and the Supreme Court's decisions about adolescent culpability. The contribution of neuroscience to discussions of adolescent blameworthiness does not lie in what neuroscience tells us about differences in the ways in which adolescents and adults act. The most important contribution is what it likely implies about the source and the long-term course of these differences. The, the, the reason that neuroscience was helpful in the court's decision-making and deliberations is not that it told us anything new about adolescence at all. It's that it confirmed, as Kennedy said, what every parent knows. And I think we need to scale back our expectations that neuroscience is going to solve this problem for us and instead look to social and behavioral science as the justification for treating adolescents differently from adults. So let me just close with four research topics that I think would be especially helpful to future discussions. The first is that very few studies of brain structure and function 
between adolescence and adulthood are linked to changes in legally relevant behaviors. We do our best in our laboratory studies to model behaviors that mimic behaviors in the real world, but the better we can do at connecting what we see in the neuroscience and behavioral laboratory studies and how people behave outside the lab, the stronger that evidence is going to be um, in, in um, making the argument. Second, we assume that adolescents are more amenable to rehabilitation than adults are. There's actually surprisingly little research that directly examines this. So one of the things that we need is research that looks more carefully at neuroplasticity during adolescence and the ways in which the adolescent brain may be more amenable and susceptible to environmental influence. A third um, is that if we're going to look to neuroscience for guidance on how we should treat young adults under the law, we need brain research that focuses specifically on individuals in their late teens and early 20s. And ideally, we need samples that will be large enough to contrast juveniles, young adults, and adults who are in their mid to late 20s. Um, and finally, you know, there's a lot of interest in whether we can use neurobiological data um, to make predictions about future behavior at the individual level, either with respect to recidivism or, um, or responses to intervention. Um, and I just want to remind us that that is a very difficult and much more, much more challenging question than making aggregate comparisons of people of different ages. And we are not there yet. We are not able to make reliable predictions about individuals' future behavior on the basis of individuals' neurobiological data. And in studies that have purported to do so, if you read the fine print, what you see is that the incremental predictive power added by the neuroscience over plain old psychological uh, evidence is very, very small. So um, let me then just conclude with this reminder that, that the most convincing evidence that adolescents should be treated um, under the law differently from adults, I believe, comes from folk science and folk wisdom. Um, we're lucky that the neuroscience ended up aligning itself with what common sense tells us about kids. I'm not sure what we would have done had it not. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you very much for that very thought-provoking talk. Um, we have time for questions, and we ask that people please come up to the microphone to ask them and announce yourself, tell us your name and what, um, why you're here, what you do. Um, maybe I'll start out with a question just to get the ball rolling. So my question to you, Dr. Steinberg, is in a room full of uh, people who are mixing scientists, there are some scientists in the room, there are some policymakers and legal experts in the room, um, what do you think can be done on the scientist side on one hand and on the policy um, and legal expert side on the other hand to try and bridge this um, gap in translation between science and policy? Sure. Um, so I think, the, I think the most important thing um, is, f is uh, let me speak first as a scientist. I think the most important thing is for scientists to understand what the legal issues are. Very often they don't. I think the, the, the biggest problem uh, with the application of science to legal and public policy is that it's almost always done after the fact. Um, that is, the scientists do their studies, they have their results, they publish them in scientific outlets, and then they look at those studies and say, here's what these studies imply about the legal or policy question. More often than not, the studies were not done in ways that informed the legal or policy question. So it seems to me that if you want to, if you want to, to play in that ballpark um, as a scientist, you need to understand um, what the legal and policy issues are and design your research with those issues in mind, not try to jerry-rig uh, an application to it after the fact. One of the things that I profited by um, when I was involved in the MacArthur Research Network on Adolescent and Juvenile Justice was that our network was, uh, was uh, uh, composed of about a, th a third scientists, a third legal scholars, and a third legal practitioners. And there were many instances in which the scientists 
had become very excited about a research study and where one of the legal practitioners would say, it sounds like an interesting study, it's not going to change anything no matter what you find. So I think that without an understanding of what the real issues are, it's, it's, it's unlikely that scientific research is going to have the applicability we wish it would. At the same time, um, I think it's important for people being trained in the law to have some understanding of science. Um, frankly, law schools have done a much better job at exposing law students to science and scientific thinking and scientific methods than science programs have done in exposing their students to issues of law and policy. But I think that the kind of training one can get at some of the better law schools like Harvard's in understanding what scientists do, how they do it, how to read and understand scientific research is a critical part of, of contributing to that dialogue. Yes. Hi, my name is Nirayal. I'm uh, an ethicist uh, working at the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, Thank you. Very interesting stuff. Um, something, I'm not sure whether this is a philosophical quibble. My background is philosophy or it actually has traction here, but I'll try it nevertheless. Um, I can see a way in which barriers to fully capacitated uh, uh, decision making can actually cut both ways and sometimes count in favor of increasing the punishment. So yes. think about somebody who can't take into account properly the risk of spending many years in jail. It, it depends on exactly how they don't, if they say sometimes ignore that factor, there's no reason to jack up the, you know, the prison terms. But if it's an attenuated perception, they perceive 30 years as 15 years, one could argue that in terms of deterrence, we have something to gain from making it 30 years if you're an adolescent, whereas 15 years only for the um, grown-ups. Um, yes. And um, one would argue, I guess the immediate response would be, yeah, but that's uh, to achieve deterrence through exceeding culpability. That's inherently unfair. You can have, do that. But who knows, maybe it's the case that so far, we have given the grown-ups for that particular offense only 15 years because we were merciful and we could get all the deterrence that we needed from 15 years. So we were under punishing, and it's permissible, HLR, a heart would tell us, say, to give 30 years for that kind of uh, act. So I don't know what you think about that. Right. So let me, let me respond to your question and then extend it a little bit. So the, the, the response to the specific question is that the research shows that adolescents are not very easily deterred no matter how severe the sanction is. Because in order to be deterred from committing a crime, so I assume we're talking about general deterrence rather than specific deterrence, but in either case, in order to be de deterred from committing a crime, one needs to be thinking about the future consequences of one's actions. Um, and we know from from research and from common observation, that adolescents are not very good at that. And studies show that um, that, that even adults are, 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 not, are not deterred very easily, and adolescents are even harder to deter than adults. So that's a specific answer. I think you raise implicitly in your question a different difficult issue, which is um, as follows. Uh, the, the, the person I'm most afraid of running into when I walk the streets of Philadelphia, is a 14-year-old with no impulse control and a gun. So the, the, the fact that that 14-year-old has immature decision-making capacity, um, on the one hand, makes us believe that it should mitigate his criminal responsibility. But on the other hand, it makes him more dangerous. And so how do we reconcile these two directions in which the same piece of evidence pulls us. I think the answer to that um, is, not, is not that we should um, uh, e e either, is, is not that we should punish adolescents more or less than adults, it's that we should punish them differently than adults. And we should punish them with, with, a, particular, with a particular thought in mind which is that this is a person who's going to probably grow out of this state that he is in now. And that what we should do with our sanctions, whether punishment, rehabilitation, or probably a combination of both, is think, what can we do to help this person progress along the developmental trajectory that's going to lead 
to becoming a law-abiding adult. And so I, I think that um, that 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 a, a, an impulsive adolescent is most likely going to become an adult with adequate self-control. An impulsive adult is probably going to be impulsive forever. And I think that those two differences between them should uh, sh should affect how we tailor our response to people of different ages. Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm from the uh, Boston University Science Journalism Program. Uh, and I'm kind of curious to know if there's any data or statistics on uh, if this is actually an increasing trend in the courtroom. I know we see it in the media a lot, but I'm wondering if there's any data to support the idea that this is actually more of a concern than it was 10 years ago? Um, yes. Uh, the, the, you know, it's very hard to track this, of course. Um, it seems, I, I think there are several pieces of evidence that point in that direction. I mean, the first is clearly the Supreme Court decisions. Um, which are all um, on the side of treating adolescents as different from adults. Um, and, and there was another important one in, in that series that I didn't talk about because it has to do with, with Miranda and, and a different set of issues. But if you look at Roper and Miller and Graham, they're all pointing to the same conclusion. Um, a second is that, um, that on balance, there have been more changes in state legislation that are consistent with the idea of treating adolescents in a different way um, and less harshly than adults than there have been changes in state legislatures in the other direction. So the pendulum clearly has shifted. Um, finally, it, it seems to me as somebody who's been working on this problem and writing about it for 20 years now, that there has been a change in the way journalists write and report these stories. When we started the MacArthur Project in 1996, um, things like adolescents' competence to be tried you know, as adults, um, their differential culpability compared to adolescents, their promise for rehabilitation and so forth, these weren't even mentioned you know, in, in high profile cases that were discussed um, in the media. And now they are more routinely so. So although I can't give you numbers, um, I can say that the pendulum has shifted in that direction. The one caveat is that there's a big difference between introducing legislation and passing and enacting legislation. And so although many states have proposed or introduced legislation that would take their state laws in this direction, uh, only a small minority of those bills have passed. And so we still have lots of places in the United States that still have the same punitive policies that were characteristic of the, the early 1990s and late 1980s. But I, I, I think most of us who work in this field think that there has been somewhat of a sea change. Great. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Letty, and I'm at the School of Education. And in um, one of my classes, we've been learning about the ability to artificially reopen plasticity in mm -hmm. adults. Um, some of this stuff has been done with rats in terms yes. of being able to change their preferences. I'm wondering, imagining a world where, you know, through drugs or other ways, it's possible to reopen that plasticity in, in adults. Do you see that having implications for sentencing, um, particularly around moving towards more rehabilitative um, kinds of approaches. Yeah, that's a, an interesting question. I mean, there people have been talking about the implications of this research for the treatment of brain injuries, um, which are harder to treat in adulthood because the brain is less plastic. And there's some uh, thinking that that if we can do this, in other words, reopen plasticity, we can be more successful. Um, whether this will lead us to have a more rehabilitative um, orientation toward adult criminals, um, I think depends on the public's, uh, the, the, the public's belief about what the purpose of, of sanctions are. So remember that um, you know, we, we, we punish people who commit crimes for all kinds of different reasons and for a mix of reasons. To try to make them behave better in the future is one of them. Um, but we also punish people um, for retributive purposes as well, and we also punish them for purposes of community safety. Um, too, and for purposes of general deterrence that is sending a message to other people. So uh, if we have the tools to be more effective at rehabilitating people, that might lead us to, 
lean toward that more than we are right now, but I don't think it's going to get rid of those other mo motivations, which, you know, in their own way serve an important part of, of the justice system's response to crime. And I say that because e even with the fact that adult brains are less plastic, they're not not plastic, they are plastic, um, and, and there are rehabilitation programs that have been shown to be effective, um, and yet we still incarcerate people anyway and don't rehabilitate them, so, the, so we're willing to ignore the, that, that now. I'm not sure that just showing that there's a magic pill you can take to make you more easily rehabilitative is going to solve that problem. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Max Krasnow. I'm um, in the Department of Psychology. Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, when you were considering the um, age progression and plasticity, that occurred to me that it might open the door for some unintended or kind of nasty consequences in the direction of bias that you were trying to avoid um, in other areas of the thinking. And, and the reason I'm thinking that is as follows. So um, recent work in evolutionary biology, um, behavioral ecology suggests that human life history is not fixed ballistic but actually fairly dynamic and that it's responsive, responsive to early life experience such that we should expect that plasticity should not be just a fixed target that you can guess by virtue of age but that early life experience should give you um, extra information on when plasticity should shut off or stay yes. open. Given that this kind of thinking if applied in a kind of utilitarian way might lead you towards harsher sentencing for people who have harsh early life experience, that's a dark place that I don't think we want to go. I just I, wanted to hear your thoughts. No, I, 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 I agree. Um, and I think that um, we are uh, maybe fortunately, you know, um, very far away from being able to judge individuals' plasticity on a case-by-case -case, um, basis. And so I think that to the extent that we can continue, it's another reason to continue to maintain that categorical distinctions based on chronological age are going to protect against um, the, the singling out of individuals that for whatever reason we believe are less likely to be able to change. But yeah, I, I, I do worry about that. I'm Scott Delaney. Uh, I'm an attorney and student in uh, social and psychi psychiatric epidemiology down at the School of Public Health. Um, I'm wondering, uh, your argument today is based uh, on our conception of neurodevelopment within sort of typically developing children and adolescents. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned that um, by using the typical development as a foundation for policy suggestions in the future, we ignore atypically developing adolescents and children. Um, and actually some children, for example, who um, have had an you know, extraordinary number of uh, adverse childhood experiences. Um, and, and sort of separately from that, my understanding is that a lot of these um, uh, policy suggestions are also based on an understanding of typical development uh, that does not account for differences between men and women, for example. Given that mental health issues are so prevalent in the criminal justice system, how do we account for um, mental health challenges, sort of subclinical um, mental differences, uh, even sex-based differences in our policies um, when they're only sort of premised on a general notion of typical development? Right. Um well, we have some judges uh, in the room who I think can respond more intelligently than I can, but it seems to me that evidence of mental illness, even subclinical uh, mental illness, or um, developmental disability, or other factors that uh, are expected to play a role in influencing a young person's behavior um, can be considered at the time of sentencing um, and and so they so I think our system does allow room for that. Now, the, if we're talking about where we draw jurisdictional boundaries, uh, I think that under the law it would be quite difficult. Well, let me back up and say, from a practical point of view, we need to pick these ages. I mean, we need to have an age at which people can drive. We need to have an age at which they can vote. It would be 
Im Im impossible to give everybody a test for everything to see whether they were competent, mature enough to do that. So we've got to do the best job we can at picking an age. And I, and I think that, to me, it makes more sense to use um, kind of average normative samples to pick those ages as long as the system has flexibility to allow deviation from those decisions when there are characteristics of an individual that warrant it. Um, in terms of sex differences, I think that the, that the consensus among most developmental neuroscientists is that although there are some differences between adolescent male and adolescent female brains, that the differences are not consistent and, and coherent enough to suggest obvious answers for how we should treat boys and girls, men and women, differently. And I, and I can't imagine, but I will defer to my legal colleagues here, I can't imagine a legal system in criminal law that would have a different set of rules for, for men and for women. So, um, you know, we have, we have, it's an imperfect system. And I, I think it's, it's made better by having flexibility in it. And that goes back, that goes to another important issue which we haven't talked about today. Um, which is the, the removal of judicial discretion from a lot of decision making in the system because that's where those factors could be most easily taken into account. And so the more that we allow these decisions to be made by statute um, and by state legislators who have all kinds of reasons to make the decisions that they make, um, the less we can take into account the particular circumstances of individuals who might not fit the, the, the average um, the average model. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Steinberg, and for your work. Uh, my name is Maureen Stravitt. I'm a physician, a pediatrician, and actually a pain specialist also, but also a member of the board of the Tau Foundation that has really embraced juvenile justice as its people. major philanthropic area. Um, as I sat here listening to this fascinating talk, uh, one of my areas of clinical specialty is in pain, and there's a real cautionary tale to be learned uh, for those of us interested in this issue from the world of pain and how policy, government, legal, medical worlds interact. Um, right now, as we know, we have a governor who said doctors will only be able to prescribe medication for three days. It can be very scary how these things evolve. When I went to medical school, I was taught that children didn't feel pain. Uh, I never heard the word neuroplasticity in medical school. Uh, things are moving very quickly, very quickly. And I think there is a cautionary tale about how we will handle this going forward. I did want to ask you, though, in, even in the pain world in which there is neuroplasticity involved as well, we find that trauma plays a major role. So if you look at chronic pain, women with chronic pain, there's a very high significant incidence of sexual abuse in their history and trauma and PTSD. We're seeing that in our veteran population. <laughs> I would also say, we, you mentioned that three to five year period. Children develop the symptoms of PTSD. There's a larger window in their neural development in which those effects can happen. I mean, we send a soldier off, they come back six months later, they have PTSD. Shouldn't we be thinking really aggressively about intervening even earlier in the identification of these children and really looking at important therapies that are not being used in children um, who are at risk of PTSD and therefore have a different brain even going into adolescence? Sure. So if you would Yes, just and, and I think that um, one of the things that we are learning from studies of trauma and exposure to stress early in life is that there are behavioral consequences of that exposure that often don't appear until adolescence because um, very frequently that exposure disrupts the development of prefrontal functioning, um, which becomes, as you know, uh, it's always important, but it becomes increasingly important as you get older. And so many of the kids that come into contact with the justice system as teenagers had early adverse um, experiences and exposure to 
um, traumatizing and um, ex ex exceedingly stressful experiences. So yes, we need to do whatever we can, both to intervene as early as possible, um, but also to prevent you know, the, the exposure to, to begin with. Uh, I'm Dr. Judith Edersheim, and along with my uh, co-director, Dr. Bruce Price, we direct the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior. So thank you for being here. We are thrilled to, I'm standing here, and I'm going to pretend to ask you a question in shameless promotion of our next two events in the Project on Law and Applied Neuroscience. So um, I don't know how you feel about this. So talking about uh, uh, periods of uberplasticity, We'll talk about three to five and talk about uh, 14 to 16. As we talk about the, the possible negative consequences of, um, of using neuroscience as a trajectory and where that goes with respect to individual cases and bias, um, I've made it no secret um, to Judge Gertner and to the people like Scott Delaney who were in the law and neuroscience class last year that um, one of my... Um, fondest ideas is to use the neuroscience to base broad brush entitlements. So if one is worried that uh, trauma at age three to five and between age 14 and 23 cause abnormal neurodevelopmental trajectories, then the answer isn't, well, let's take that into account at neuroscience sentencing. The answer is that there is an entitlement to the development of an intact brain and that the circumstances which give rise to these developmental abnormalities should be the subject of social entitlement programs as are school lunches, as are the right to public schooling. And so the broad brush argument might be, uh, might be implemented there. And in, uh, in February, where is uh, Dr. Strafford? Uh, in, in February, Dr. Strafford will come back to speak on fetal pain. And in March, we will have um, Chuck Nelson was here a minute ago. Uh, Dr. Chuck Nelson, one of the world's experts on that first plasticity period from three to five and the effects of trauma. And also uh, Dr. Carrie Ressler, who uh, is now at McLean and who will speak on the toxicity of urban stress and environments in uh, that age group. So we are addressing those and I wonder what you think about that. That was the, that was the little... I'm glad you're addressing those. Um, uh, look, I, I don't know how to draw a distinction between um, the, the rights to have healthy brain development and the rights to have health in other ways, too, or the rights to have adequate stimulation for the purposes of facilitating neurobiological development or the right to have adequate education even if we can't measure its outcomes in, in the brain. I think, as, as you know from our earlier discussion today, uh, we, we, we can frequently refer to neuroscience to get people on a bandwagon that they wouldn't get on otherwise. That doesn't mean that we necessarily need neuroscience to make that argument. If I, if I said to you, without even referring to the brain, that all children you know, have the right to grow up under healthy circumstances, you probably agree with that. Um, if I you know, recast that sentence and say all children have the right to have normal synaptic pruning and myelination and connectivity develop, you, I know you would agree with that, but it, I mean, it's kind of the same thing. So, so, it, so, so if you want to sell this idea about what, what children are entitled to at different ages, and you think that you can make a better sales pitch you know, by showing brain scans, by all means, make your pitch. But let's understand what it is, you know, but let's just accept it for what it is, that it is just a way of drawing people's attention to something that they might not attend to otherwise. People have called me an instrumentalist before, so I don't feel badly about that. As I leaned over and said to Judge Gertner, I'll take any fig leaf that is floating. I'm happy with that. But that's, in my view, not the only reason to use the neuroscience to align with the behavioral 
evidence. I should add that we've understood the, that um, toxic stress uh, impairs development. We've known that for 25 years to 50 years and no one has paid attention. So, so uh, the fig leaf argument actually you know, you know best of all, has made dramatic improvements in the justice system. But there is another reason, I think, to think about this with respect to um, super developmental periods, because it combats the statement that I hear in opposition, which is, well, some kids do really well. Some kids do fine. So it's not, it's not that this is a toxic environment. It's that some kids are worse than others, and they're worse than others in these intangible character ways, and that, and that this is why, growing up in, on the same block, five of them do well and 20 of them don't. And I think the neuroscience actually diffuses uh, the bias out of that argument in a, in a responsible way. And so I would think at the very ground level, that's one reason why neuroscience aligning with behavioral evidence takes some of the politics out of distribution arguments. I'm not sure that I agree. Uh, I, I don't... I don't entirely f follow the argument. Um, if, 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 people are, if people are more persuaded by showing neurobiological insult you know, than they are by showing insult that's reflected in performance on cognitive tests or, or through a psychological diagnosis or something, um, I, I, you know, I understand that, but it, it, it doesn't, you know, I'm a psychologist by training, and I, don't, and I don't like the feeling that what I do is kind of down there, and what the neuroscientists do is up there. Um, you know, and I, I think as psychologists, we, we have not done a good job in, in communicating the important discoveries of our field to the public, and I think because it's easier to be, I think, a charlatan psychologist than a charlatan neuroscientist, that we have a lot of bad players in the field of psychology. Um, that may change as neuroscience, you know, becomes more accessible to more and more people who are not necessarily qualified to engage in it. But so right now, there's a there's a credibility gap between the two. But that doesn't. That, that, that doesn't negate the importance of, of the behavioral and psychological evidence for making the same case. So you and I would make the same case. Um, I'm not sure that you need the neuroscience to make it, um, ex except to point to things that maybe might be persuasive to people who you'd have difficulty persuading otherwise. Thank you. Hi, Ruby Yarmish, uh, master's student at William James College in Newton. Um, also interning at the Fisher College Counseling Center, so I'm, I'm pretty in the trenches with, uh, with the, the young adult population. Um, in terms of the way society is approaching adolescent development, especially brain development, uh, it, maybe in regards to Rumspringa in the, uh, in the Amish community, are, are we ignoring kind of the purpose for this, you know, hyperplasticity of the brain at that point? Are we not fostering it? It enough? Are we not feeding it enough? Is there any research that's, that neuroscience is now corroborating in the behavioral realm that kind of indicates that maybe we're, we're not approaching it in the correct space and that's why we're coming to the... You know, uh, you know I, I think that, I mean, I, I've argued that we're not. To take, we're not attending to it and we're not taking advantage of it. Um, I, th I think that the closest we would have, the closest I think we have for evidence of that is that we now have studies showing that certain kinds of practices, like mindfulness training, as, as an example, um, uh, s seem to contribute to um, brain function and brain activity in ways that strengthen skills and capacities like self-control and self-regulation that are important for success in society. So then, if you if you look at that and then say, okay, well, how much are we doing? How much are we doing this for kids? How much of this are we exposing them to? How much of it is incorporated into our schooling and so forth? I think you would say, no, we're not doing very much of that. So I think there are lessons that we can learn from from neuroscience that should inform. Um, education policy, for example, and there's a conference going on today in Boston on the, the learning and the brain, in which a lot of this is, going, is, is being discussed as we speak, and it's going on today, tomorrow, and Sunday, I believe. So I think we're not taking advantage of it. Um, I think 
that, that we ought to be taking more advantage of it. Thank you. All right, please join me again in thanking Dr. Steinberg.